France loses in Beirut as Lebanon <coughs> loses government. This is what we're going to be talking here today at the news bar. So everybody, just relax and just, just, just pull up a seat here and uh, have yourself a drink or a smoke or some combination thereof, whatever. And let's look at this story. Let's first off, let's just get to the heart of the matter. Lebanon reels after efforts to form government collapse. This is from Channel News Asia. Beirut, Lebanon was left reeling on Sunday, September 27th, without the slightest prospect of ending multiple crises after its premier designate stepped down following the failure of talks to form a government despite international pressures. Mustafa Adib's resignation on Saturday ended efforts to hammer out a reformist government in the wake of a colossal August 4th explosion in Beirut that killed 190 people and injured thousands and ravaged large parts of the capital. This is still from Channel News Asia here. Okay, so that's just the... That's just basically the general gist. The general gist is, okay, everybody, the story is this. Lebanese government could not come to an agreement. And it, as in essence, Lebanon is, well, going to be without a government. Going to be without a government for quite some time as a matter, most, most realistically, maybe another year and a half or more without fundamentally be without a government so let's look at uh, Lebanon before we uh, go a little bit much further here we've got Lebanon here it's a Lebanese Republic and its national anthem is all of us for our country so let's hear them If they do, I apologize. I missed. Uh, that's one thing, by the way. You'll never hear me on this show. I will never really be dis disrespectful to people's uh, <coughs> national anthems. Not even my own American national anthem. Now, in general, I really don't give a fig a woggle about national anthems. <coughs> I really would rather that they die immediately all across the world. But I understand that uh, I am in a significant minority in those views. So. You know, I like to listen to the national anthems, though. I think that's that's cool. I give that to you out of love. So the Lebanese Republic is bordered by Syria to the north and east, and Israel to the south. While Cyprus lies west across the Mediterranean Sea, so it's in the it's in the tangle of stuff. We have uh, we have we have gas deposits uh, out in the Cyprian area. We've got Turkey swimming out there and <clears throat> trying to get its little nuzzle here the russians are interested in in lebanon because right there i mean the russians have a strong position in um in syria so yeah lebanon is of a big importance to them and you've got maybe the the one that has the most significant of outside of Lebanon, the most significant power in Lebanon, it it would be arguably, probably, I'm going to say two nation states. <clears throat> One, Iran, and the other, France. So France, because, well, France has a long history in Lebanon, and much of uh, Lebanon's, not all of it, Lebanon has a very, what's, what's called, confessional democracy democratic parliament confessional that means they have they have you you can vote for for people in various positions but certain positions must be held by people within various sectarian identities which we're going to get a lot deeper into so 
So brace yourself, folks. I give you the essentials up front, that way the folks that are into the to the to the whatever stuff that follows they, they'll get this. So right now though, Macron he's not happy. He's accusing Lebanon's leaders of betrayal for failures, <clears throat> and he is an unhappy dude. It's just uh, I am I'm ashamed for them. Dude, I am ashamed for them, he says. Wait, wait, I gotta back that up again there. Okay, what's it? I am ashamed. I am ashamed for your leaders. I am ashamed for them. Dang. Just Fres Fr French president. This is from France 24. French president Emmanuel Macron on Sunday accused Lebanon's leaders of betraying their promise over their failures to form a government in the wakes of the Beirut port blast. He gave the country's political class four to six weeks to implement his roadmap, but ruled out immediate sanctions. So that is, uh, that is where we're at. Macron is not happy. And then we come on over to here and we get this article from the Jerusalem Post. <clears throat> Hezbollah defeated France in Lebanon. France had wanted to reduce the sectarian nature of the government, but Hezbollah has increased its clout in recent years. A month and a half after a massive explosion, Beirut caused a crisis in Lebanon that saw the government fall and part. It's because, you see this? See that? Government did it because of that. And that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what, look at this guy. Look at this guy. Oh, what a, what a fey fella. What, what a rather fey fella. It looks like he, he really could never, uh, actually pull a trigger unless he was behind you and you were sleeping. But he'll certainly order others to do it. <clears throat> Regional media from the UAE to Turkey are focused on what might come next in Lebanon. Lebanon's Prime Minister designate Mustafa Adib resigned according to Turkey's... Oh, okay. No, now it's more than just Turkey. Get out of there popping up on me, getting all up in my face. Oh, you didn't see that pop up. It's off out of the screen. Lebanon's analysis quoted at Ayin. Al Ayin said that Lebanon could be heading to chaos at, as Hezbollah and the Amal movement are preventing the creation of a new government. Hezbollah, Iran. See, Iran. This is Iran versus <coughs> France. Preventing the creation of a, a new government. France has sought to mediate in Lebanon with Macron playing a key role. This even included meetings with Hezbollah's members of the Lebanese parliament. The political parties and entrenched sectarian elites in Lebanon now appear to have sought to frustrate France's attempts at reform. And so that's that situation. So that's that's gonna that's gonna go on for a long, a long, long, long time. We're gonna get to a different little uh little cozy little world here as we uh we're going to look at this uh, article here. Yeah, we're going to do that. Where, 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 Where's my... Uh, do I got my... New, there we go. i got to get that music, dude. What's your music not playing for us? Of course you need the music. It smooths out the bad. It just smooths... It rounds out the corners. That's what it does. Constructivism. The core idea behind constructivism is that identity, whether national, ethnic, religious, tribal, or otherwise, emerges out of institutions and practices over time. Although such social identities may have deep roots, they do not reflect immutable affiliations. Rather, they emerge out of specific historical processes, some of which have occurred in relatively recent history. While constructivist approaches may recognize that these categories have real meaning to people, they deny that there is something necessary or innate about them. And I, I will tell you that uh, we now have post-constructivism, and that's more where we're at in America, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. Prominent examples of constructivist arguments in the literature on ethnic politics focus on the policies and practices of colonial ruling authorities and chiefly the colonial histories on continents of Africa and Asia, for example, the divide and rule policies favoring one ethnic or religious group over another, either created, altered, or, or reified ethnic or tribal categories, often laying the groundwork for conflict and violence along identity-based lines in the post-independence period. 
in the Ottoman Empire, you know what, I'm not going to read the rest of this part, of this part here, but I'm going to read more from this article. However, I just want to note here that constructivism, in a sense, well, I'll just say this is the, I'm not, you know what, I don't want to get complicated. Just stop it. Uh, in, uh, in the sense that they're using history as their scientific uh, measuring tool, they're, they're the extension of Hegel. Hegel, who is the one who fundamentally shifted, <coughs> well, not all people have embraced the historical analysis of the of the human organism but uh many have and certainly the constructivists uh, this is are the yeah the constructivists this is certainly the the camp that they're ultimately coming from now they're, they're now here's instrumentalism so as they're describing it an alternative framework for by the way just just bear with me this is all related to lebanon and i'm going to give you a clue it has to do with their confessionalism so just bear with me. Even the article. The article itself is called Lebanon, the Sectarian Identity Test Lab. So this is all relevant to give you a sense of what's going on in Lebanon. Instrumentalism, an alternative framework for explaining the rising political salience of identity-based cleavages, assumes that economic or political interests are the true motivation behind political mobilization along what appears to be ethnic or religious lines. Elites, especially the leaders of political or social organizations, are key actors in instrumental approaches. Such cultural entrepreneurs deploy language symbols and appeals rooted in the history or doctrine of a particular ethnic or religious community as they engage in struggles over power, consciously playing upon these identities to shore up their own support. Examples of the instrumentalization of identity abound in the Middle East, such as Bashar Assad's use of the sectarian card during the Syrian uprising, claiming that the opposition largely consisted consist of Islamic extremists who pose a dire threat to Syria or Saddam Hussein's promotion of neo-tribalist policies to consolidate his authority in the authority in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Instrumentalism, in a sense, is kind of going to the, the, I guess, the empirical, the, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best, so if I sound like an idiot, I do apologize. I'm not a trained professional. I'm just a dude with an opinion. But as I understand it, uh, when we're looking at constructivism, this is, this is the idea that, uh, well, the, the, the world outside of us is what is constructing us. Uh, and and then you're getting into instrumentalism. <clears throat> and this is the idea in... It, 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 basically, constructivism is uh, <sighs> kind of empiricism. And instrumentalism is sort of idealism. In, that, in those camps, at least. So, instrumentalism is the it's the individual acting that uh, by 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 the idea in their head that makes the world. And I'm not going to go into all their examples. So I'm going to get it now into institutionalism. A final category of approaches is based on the claims that the design of formal political institutions can promote <coughs> or deter the rise of ethno-religious conflict and violence. Much of this research centers on debate about variants of power-sharing institutions and the optimal electoral rules for divided societies. On the one hand, Arend Leifert famously argues, argues in favor of consociationalism. 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 Now, that's another rabbit hole to go down, and I'm choosing not to do it for time's sake, uh, uh, but I do, I, I, may, I might later, maybe I encourage you to check it out yourself, in which, and may, hopefully I'll remember to, in which the leaders from different ethnic or sectarian groups retain significant autonomy and power over decision making within their own communities and adopt national level decisions largely by consensus with inbuilt veto power aimed at checking any group from becoming dominant over the others. On the other hand, <coughs> political scientist David Horowitz 
suggests that institutions that allocate power along communal lines tend to reinforce identity-based divisions. He argues, instead for integrative institutions that compel politicians to seek the support of members of other communities to gain and retain power. These approaches are useful in explaining how existing institutions structure the incentives facing politicians to cultivate support beyond their own religious communities. So you force them to build a coalition that doesn't simply rely on their faction. Nonetheless, even if a clear institutional recipe for promoting more inclusive politics can be identified, politicians must first agree to adopt the prescribed electoral system or government structure, an outcome that is far from sure. Now we're, we're going to get to the last part here that we're going to uh, actually cover, <clears throat> at least in, in this video. Now I do, I will have a link to this article and the other, some of the other articles that I covered here below. So as I, as I usually do, so you can check the articles out for yourself, draw your own conclusions. <clears throat> Lebanon is the example par excellence of a political system structured along explicitly sectarian lines. Prior to the outbreak of civil war in 1975, it was even lauded as an exemplary case of consociationalism. The system also incorporates element, and this is getting back to the confessionalism. This is what makes it a cons consociationalism. So it's a, it's kind of a, in where it's a kind of a, com a, a combination of confederal and and social. I don't know association, confederal association. So it's a consociation not an association it's a consociation like a, uh there's a there are federal systems where they're not and then there are confederal systems and federal systems tend to have more uh more autonomous power from the local region so that's essentially but in this case it's it's actually based upon sectarian assumptions the system also incorporates elements of Horowitz's integrative principles by requiring voters to cast ballots for all candidates, even those from other religious communities. However, pre-electoral bargains among political leaders and parties from different communities effectively undercut incentives to politicians to garner support from citizens from other religious communities. Furthermore, the very fact of the Civil War as well as chronic political tensions and episodic political violence demonstrate that the formal institutions cannot solve all problems. One thing is certain, the allocation of political offices by sect, which makes access to power and resources contingent on communal affiliation, boosts the salience of religion in political and social life. The allocation of political offices by sect... It, uh, it has a tendency to create uh, all types of, uh, whether they're intended or unintended, all types of, of institution structures, form, and certainly belief systems do this. And when belief systems are attached to real government power in which uh, money is exchanging hands and guns are protecting interests, then you've got a whole other element when it comes to sectarianism in general what all the nation states need is what america has the capacity to be and all of these nation states have the capacity to be as well if they so chose but they would have to overcome a lot of uh, physical physical limitations and well physical and resource limitations and it has nothing to do with their their people dumb or hood it has to do with the circumstances of the lands where they live and uh, our inability to our inability or unwillingness to spread all of the wonderful tech out there that could empower the people of lebanon to be self-sustaining right where they live to significantly higher degrees and not self-sustaining because they're tied to some massive green project run by yet another international mega corporation another de facto nation state an unaccountable nation state even more dangerous than nation states themselves uh but but truly from open source tech the ability for the people of lebanon to actually coexist is quite easy it's and they don't need a sectarian government all they need is a government that can't do things that violate the ability of people with different values and beliefs to coexist with one another and it can be done. America has, has proven in some ways and in some parts, imperfectly, but 
it's proven that it can happen america is fundamentally a pluralistic diverse world it just is now i think at some point all these diverse groups are going to have to come to realize no matter how much you hate the other people we still all actually do need each other and we all tremendously benefit from figuring out a way that we can we can even hate each other and still make bread together as i say as long as you can figure out a way to make bread together and we have it we have it we have a long history we have a people over here with a long history of the idea of the bill of rights and it, it i even see black lives matter people that are so anti bill of rights in so many ways maybe they don't even realize how you know if you if you extend the the whole idea the whole notion of hate speech laws hate speech laws are always going to be defined by whichever regime is power significantly even more raising the cost of that political victory just raising all kinds of opportunities for people to justify violence because i mean what's at what's at stake what's at stake is the government criminalizing your thoughts and the government is going to shift according to who's in power. And that's what it's all about. And and they support that. But yet, even though they support this, they're still out there. They're, they're literally, I saw a, a video recently, they're literally going into restaurants and they start yelling at people. When people stand up to them and say, man, get the hell out of here. They're like, oh, first, first. They, they, they even, they understand. That makes me think that ultimately a lot of these people, they're angry right now, even though like whatever the feelings they have, they're going to calm down. A lot of these, even that person in that video could still very well, they understand they're, that's an American, whether that person knows it or not. Maybe once they, once they cool down, they realize that they're actually an American. That's our fundamental gift that we have. Luck in the circumstance that we have the Bill of Rights, and it is so imbued in so many of us that it's more than just words on paper. It's an assumption that people have. It's why people have so many guns. It's why black Americans are going out there and buying guns by the gazillions. And now it's like the, the Democrats have this awkward position where they kind of have to cheer black Americans buying guns and spin it to look like they're preparing for a war against the white races. Uh, but still, what they end up having to do is kind of uh, continue to reveal the reason fundamentally why human beings should have guns. And a government that does not allow its citizens to have guns is fundamentally a not a government to be trusted. You end up with something like Lebanon. So, hey, Lebanon, I don't know necessarily I wouldn't want to just hand out a whole bunch of guns to people carte blanche. I think there's a, 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 a there's some methodology as people have the secure situation around them. And, and it's so many things that we can do in Lebanon today, I'm sure, in terms of the tech, the hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, 3D printing, uh, 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 microgrids, micro factories, uh, that's tied to the free 3D printing. There, There's so many opportunities in the here and now. We can rebuild whole parts of Lebanon to, well, they can rebuild whole parts of Lebanon to be structured in ways that offer individuals the opportunity to physically appreciate the power of the individual and the necessity of the other individuals around that individual. And I got a lot of ideas about that, but never mind. But there's a lot of solutions to getting Lebanon to the place where their little confessional democratic parliamentary government is no longer needed at all and i think with that i i think we're gonna i think we're gonna end this uh we're gonna end this episode and i did want to i thought it was important for me to touch on some of those uh philosophical uh constructs that uh they're using to uh and there's so much that i wanted to say there about my own because i have my own theories and my own thoughts but i'm trying to keep this Trying to keep it tight, y'all. Trying to keep it tight. It's what I do. Trying to keep it tight. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining me here for a... Uh, for the... Uh, this is a... Uh, I guess it's turning into a news bar. I've done a couple of earlier episodes, and I think now it's official from here on out. This is going to be a news bar. Frico Talks News is a news bar. France loses in Beirut as Lebanon loses government. Hope this helps you uh, understand a little bit more what deeper issues what's going on in Lebanon the surface issues and give you enough resources uh, with the links below for you to, to make up your own minds so have a great rest of your day because I mean really unless the wolves are at your door right this very second why the hell not